Now that we've derived the supply of labor and the demand for labor, let's put them together to model the market equilibrium. Here's our standard supply and demand graph with price of labor or wage on the vertical axis and quantity of labor or number of hours on the horizontal axis. The upward sloping supply curve comes from individuals' trade-offs between leisure and consumption. A higher wage means a higher opportunity cost of leisure, leading people to choose less leisure and more work. The downward sloping demand curve comes from firms maximizing profits by setting marginal revenue product of labor equal to wage. A higher wage means that the firm needs to get a higher marginal revenue product out of its workers, leading firms to hire less labor. Here, where the two curves intersect, is the market equilibrium. At this point, firms are happy to pay this wage for this many hours of labor, and workers are happy to supply this many hours of labor at this wage. And just like in our other supply and demand models, shifts in demand or supply will change the equilibrium. If a celebrity endorsement from Kim Kardashian significantly raises the price clothing makers can charge for corsets, what happens to our supply and demand curves for the labor to produce these newly popular corsets? Well, the supply curve doesn't change at all. Labor supply only depends on the leisure versus consumption trade-off that individuals make. That trade-off hasn't changed. But the demand curve does change. A rise in prices raises the marginal benefit or marginal revenue product of the next hour of labor. Paying a worker for an extra hour of labor to make one more corset is now more beneficial to the firm since that corset can now fetch a higher price. So the demand curve shifts out. Workers are now more valuable and firms want to hire more workers at any given wage. This celebrity endorsement resulted in equilibrium in which corset manufacturers are hiring more labor at a higher wage. Suppose alternatively that there's a sudden boon in quality TV shows. Many people decide they're happy to give up some consumption in order to have more leisure time to watch all this quality TV. This time, labor demand doesn't change because the improved television landscape does nothing to alter the marginal revenue product of labor for firms. Workers are still just as productive if they decide to work for a firm. But labor supply does change. Workers need more incentive to actually go to work for these firms. Firms have to pay a higher wage to pull them away from their TVs. So the supply curve shifts up, and the resulting equilibrium has fewer workers working for a higher wage. To recap, just like goods, labor is an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve. And where the two cross is the equilibrium of the competitive market. But what if we don't like the wage given by the equilibrium? What happens if we or the government decides to change it? This question gets to the policy that's one of the most debated in all of economics, the minimum wage. The minimum wage is a price floor set by the government. It's a law that says workers can't be paid below some certain level. The federal minimum wage has been around for more than 80 years in the US. It's currently set at $7.25 an hour, though many states and cities have their own minimum wages that are higher. Indeed, the city of Seattle recently raised its minimum wage to $15 an hour, more than twice the national level. So how do these minimum wages impact the labor market? Well, that depends on whether we're talking about electricians or fast food cashiers. Let me explain. Start with electricians. As in any other market, we have a supply of electricians who provide labor hours to the market. And we have a demand for electricians by people who need electrical work done in their homes. Given these sample supply and demand curves, the equilibrium for this market for electricians is 3 million hours of electrical work at a wage of $20 an hour. In this case, if the government comes in and imposes a minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, what happens? Absolutely nothing. The electricians in this market are already getting more than $7.25 an hour in wages. The minimum wage is not binding. This is an important lesson to remember. For government policies to matter, they have to actually constrain the market equilibrium. Otherwise, they're irrelevant. Now let's turn to fast food cashiers. Again, we have supply of individuals who could provide labor hours to the market. And we have a demand for these people by fast food restaurants who need workers to staff their stores. Given these examples supply and demand curves, the equilibrium for this market for fast food cashiers is 4 million hours of work at a wage of $5 an hour. So what happens in this case if the government comes in and imposes a minimum wage of $7.25? The equilibrium with $5 an hour is no longer legal. So what will the restaurant's demand for workers be at the new wage of $7.25? To answer this, we use the demand curve. At a wage of $7.25, restaurants only demand 3.5 million hours. The higher wage means that these firms are less interested in hiring workers. 
In the short run, they might just produce less with fewer workers. In the long run, they might substitute machines. In any case, the minimum wage leads to these restaurants demanding fewer workers. And what happens to the supply of workers? To answer this, we can use a supply curve. At a wage of $7.25, workers want to supply 4.5 million hours of labor. People who weren't willing to take a job at Burger King for $5 an hour are interested now that the wage has gone up to $7.25. So workers want to supply 4.5 million hours of labor, but restaurants only demand 3.5 million. There's an excess supply of labor, better known as unemployment. These people want to work for the new wage, but the restaurants don't need that much labor. These people don't get hired. And in this new equilibrium, this triangle here represents the deadweight loss. These workers would be happy to work for between $5 and $7.25, and restaurants would be happy to hire them at that wage. But the government won't let these trades be made. As a result, social welfare is dropped by the area of this deadweight loss triangle. Generally speaking, in a competitive labor market equilibrium, a minimum wage that's higher than the market wage will cause unemployment. At the same time, some workers will get higher wages than they would have had without the minimum wage. So as is often the case in economics, we have a trade-off. Some workers are better off, but total welfare has fallen. How do we feel about this trade-off? That will depend on how much welfare falls. In fact, a large body of economics research finds that past minimum wages have not caused much deadweight loss. How can this be? We'll explore that question in the application video.